great to have you on here to talk with us. Uh, congrats again on your on your Hall of Fame news. I know the induction is still down the road, but um, you. that you know, I know people joke when you, when you do Hall of Fame, it just means you're old. But what does that what does that mean to you when you when you think about your career being honored at this point? You're still very much in it as a coach. You know, it's. I mean, you've been part of the organization for a while. Um, you know, my history with the organization as a player, starting from the junior team through the national team, um, and then, you know, being fortunate enough to contribute as a coach. Um, I mean, for us in the sport, it's, it's always been the highest level. It's always been something, let's see, you know, I feel like as an alumni, obviously, and I care greatly about it, and I really want to see it do well, and I think – you know, your relationship changes with it over the years as far as how you can contribute. And right now, it, it's just really all about the kids. And it's all about the athletes and, and giving them a, a you know, chunk of your, your experience to you know, hopefully so they can, they can fulfill their dreams. Now, we're, we're obviously going to open this up to some questions here in a little while. You, you, you have kind of the two halves of your water polo life as a player and as a coach. At, at what point did you realize people started to know you more as a coach than as a player since you've been out of the pool for a little while? Um, I, that, that's an interesting question because uh, I just, you know, you don't really think about it too much. And, but there's, sure. there's moments where you, let's just say, when I, when I took my Long Beach State team to Barcelona in 2006, 2007, 2007, um, you know, I played there in 97 and then 99 and, and little kids were coming up, and, and they knew who I was, saying, hey, hey, hey Arroyo, Arroyo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you, 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 sometimes you go to pools around here, and they're like, oh, that, that's the Long Beach State coach. Okay, that's, that's – Yeah. But, um, you know, I – community-wise, and I, I – I get any recognition is, 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 a, is a fortunate thing, so. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. As you – you know, this is probably a hard one to pick because you're, you're so uh, in, in deep as a coach now, but as you think back on both – did you enjoy playing more or do you enjoy coaching more? I'm sure there's pros and cons for both. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when it's, when it's game time, you know, the, the player, the player blood gets flowing a little bit, um, you know, but then, you know, it's training time when they're, when they're diving in the pool and about to do a long swim set or something, you're like, yeah, so it's, it's okay to be a coach today. <laughs> so there, there's now, you know, when, when you, when you think back on your career and I think, you know, People obviously know you for Long Beach State. Uh, they know that you were on the Olympic team. Go back even a little before that, right? And and just and just for some of our younger viewers, right, that that aren't aren't aware, right? You and I. This is all fresh in my mind because I was just going over your bio with you, right, for your for your Hall of Fame. But you you know you come out of Orange County as as a great swimmer and water polo player, and then you jump into a a Cal program that is already established as a really really good program. We get a lot of questions on here about people wanting to fit in. You know, they join a team and how do they make sure they're part of it and all of that stuff. And, you know, I'm curious from your perspective, you join this this legendary program and it doesn't miss a beat, right? You run off three straight titles. What was that process like to integrate yourself into a team that was so good? You know, um, with all these, let's say, kind of books and cliches and things about, like, dealing with failure and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, I wanted to be with the best. And at that time, Cal was um, by far the best program. Um, I think just kids today, you know, we're, we, we got to get, you got to get after it. I mean, you got to get yourself in a situation where you are, you are forced to perform well every day. Um, people are, oh, there's too much pressure on the kids. Okay, maybe but some kids is that. But you know what? Put yourself there, and then and then you know hit some roadblocks. That's fine, and, and go through it. But you know what? You're hitting roadblocks with the best. So um, as long as you're in that situation, you're in that culture of, of of high performance, of high intensity, and good things good things come out of that. Those situations. So I've always tried to do that um, you know, throughout my playing career. You know, we, we've been talking a lot over the last couple of weeks because there is no water polo. To, to actually play, it's it's evolved into a lot of mental skills and things you can do on your own. And something that comes up a lot is confidence, you know, and how do you build it? How do you maintain it? And I, you know, I'm curious to go back again to those early days at Cal. Was there a moment or moment that kind of resonated with you even even now as you think back that 
gave you confidence that you belonged. Like you knew you were putting in the hard work, but did something happen that validated the hard work and that left you with some confidence to go forward? You know, I, I think some of that stuff subliminal, um, you know, nowadays with, uh, you know, training hours and, and limitations on things, what you can and can't do as coaches. And I remember staying after practice with Humbert and uh, Chris Humbert and Julian Bailey, and we would just, I would get turned by Chris Humbert every day for 15 <laughs> minutes. And you know, it's at some point it wasn't, it wasn't getting turned every single time. And, you know, we're just kind of pool rats and just kind of wanted, we just wanted to get better. Um, so you stayed after and shot and you stayed after and, um, you know, when I remember coaching at Cal, guys like Mike Scharf, you know, they wanted, hey, can we get in the pool? Hey, can we shoot around? I mean, it's just that kind of mentality is is gonna is gonna get get you where you go, you know, where you want to go. Um, and, and through that, you you reduce fear because you just you build so much confidence on just doing that extra stuff. I mean, I saw a Michael Jordan meme the other day on, you know, I, I get rid of my fear through my because I've done this a thousand times kind of things. And and I think when you're doing it, you don't even realize that you're just kind of like yeah, I'm just you know what I'm. I'm feeling pretty good about this right now. So, yeah, no, that's you know, and and, and I would gather that I know that your answer might might relate, uh, you know, again to that kind of repetition and hard work and that sort of thing. But a lot of questions we get as well, you know, as people work through their career, kind of figuring out what what they should be doing to make sure that they stay a valuable part of their team. You know, so it's one thing to to make your team, whether it's high school, JV, varsity, club. A, B, C, right? What are some things that you did, you know, whether it was making a Cal team, making an Olympic team that you felt like were vital to not even necessarily the team winning, but, but, but you being a part of the positive culture of the team? You know, I think everyone, you know, obviously now as a coach, you, you, you really appreciate the, the kids who do the little things. Um, on being part of the team, the guys who are just happy to kind of be there, the guys that set the tone and work out. And, and we're so caught up with starting. We're so caught up with playing time. We're so caught up with this stuff. And um, I mean, the, the, the bench, the bench behavior, the, the culture of the group um, really puts you over the, the hump on, on some of those close games. And um, you can't fake it. You know, you, you just can't. If the hard work's there and if, if the true belief is there and, the kids truly are connected, then um, that's what's going to get you over the hump, um, you know, and, and that familiar, creating familiarity and practice with those things breed confidence. So the more familiar and the more comfortable you are in a situation, then there's less distractions and it leads you to, to be able to perform better as a group, individually and as a group. We're talking with Gavin Arroyo, uh, head coach for Long Beach, state assistant coach with the men's senior national team, two-time Olympian, Hall of Famer. The, the resume is lengthy. You talked about distractions and, and kind of working around those things. The team that you work with now, Team USA, facing a very large distraction in that they can't practice. Their Olympic Games have been postponed. You're in constant communication with this group. What's what's kind of the, the feeling around Team USA as they, as they navigate something that no team has really had to tackle? You know, this, this group's pretty special. They've, they've been through some, through some stuff with, um, you know, the night in Korea World Championship. Um, they, they've seen more adversity than, than any group uh, has had to go through, you know, and then now leading up to this thing. And we've been, we went through some individual meetings this morning, and, and I think one of the things we keep stressing is, is that here's your opportunity, to Coach Udovacic says, to steal some time. So, you know, we're all locked up in our rooms and in our houses and doing whatever we can do. But when, you re when we reemerge, and we will at some point, how are you going to be individually? So here's, here's a chance to shift from, you know, stuff that we get to do together all the time and things that we take for granted. Oh, we get to train today and get better at six on five or et cetera, et cetera. Now we're going to go in a little bit of a cocoon state. And, and what you do in that state is pretty important. And like I joked with one of the guys today, like, we could be having this meeting, you could be doing one-arm push-ups. Like, there's just, when, when, when this cocoon opens, what are, what are we going to look like? And I think staying on that message and, and so guys don't get sidetracked on, okay, well, now Olympics is a year away. I can just kind of take a break. I mean, take a mental break for sure with, you know, the grind of going eight hours a day or what we're doing with that. But here's, here's a good mental break where you can just focus on yourself, you know, heal up some nicks, some injuries maybe. Um, you know, focus on your mental well-being. 
Um, there's plenty of video nowadays of uh, Coach Rodriguez sending the guys out. A lot of video to catch up on. So there's there's tons of stuff we can be doing, and, and we are doing so. A lot of people that respond to our live videos, or they send in emails, and it's about what can they be doing when they can't get into a pool. And I know that Chris Bates is sending out workouts to the guys, and we're sharing some of that with the members as well. But um, from, from your standpoint as a coach, and as you think back to a player, you know, what are what are some things that the guys are able to do? What are some things that, you know, as, as someone that still gets in, that someone that still gets in and swims occasionally, what are some things that you're doing to try and just stay active and keep the guys active? And your Long Beach State players, how are they staying active? What are some things people can do at home? You know, we're, we're really fortunate at, at USA Water Polo to have, um, you know, Bridge Athletic, the, the, those platforms. Um, you know, I, I know if they probably did this back in our day, we would have been like, okay, well, here we go. We can, we can, yeah. Huh. So we can actually, uh, you know, do testing. Um, even if the guys don't have weights, there's, well, I know our, our trainer's driving some weights around to some of the guys. Um, band workouts, you know, if you, you can hurt yourself pretty good with just body weight and bands. Um, if you, if you do it longer. Um, so we're just kind of trying to do those things and, and really just focus on our, our, our uh, the things that we can do, obviously. Um, so. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a challenging time. And I think uh, this, this is a name that you and I will know, but the, the younger folks might not, but I think Herschel Walker wrote a whole book on just body weight workouts. Yeah. And uh, he was pretty shredded for those that remember Herschel Walker. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and the other thing too is, I mean, most of the guys have been playing full time for how many years? Yeah. For, you know, there's not a lot of break from the actual pool. I mean, this is a great chance to just kind of build, uh, I don't want to say motivation, but, you know, we always, you know, unleash, you know, unleash the tiger. I don't want to get on this tiger thing. With the <laughs> <laughs> you know, let, let, let some momentum build within yourself. Like, you know, the things that we always take it for granted of, oh yeah, okay, uh, training, 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 but, now you can't train the way you always have. Now you don't have your team. I mean, the level of gratitude that can rise right now, the, 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 I always talk about a vial of passion that you have when you start playing and, you know, slowly gets reduced over the years and years and years. And let, let's refill that vial of passion and, um, and really let that, so when it's time when those gates open, man, it's, it's, it's just on and there's, and there's nothing stopping us. So I'm a fan of Joe. I'm a fan of Joe and Joe's team. <laughs> uh, you wear so many hats, so there's there there's so many areas in water polo that you can speak to. We've had a few college coaches on in the last couple of weeks, and a, a lot of younger athletes they they badly want to play at the college level, regardless if Division One, you know, whatever it might be. I'm curious, just for a, for a general college water polo player, as you're thinking about someone that you're potentially recruiting, what are some some things you would like to see in the recruiting process and what are some, I guess, quote unquote, turnoffs, things that might make you look at someone else, whether it's a way someone conducts themselves in communication, how they meet you personally or via email, uh, ad attitude in the pool, that sort of stuff. You know, it's funny when, when I first started Long Beach, it was all about, um, okay, he's big, let's, let's recruit him and that's it. Um, I always liked big guys. I always felt that you could, if you could teach big guys, then you know everything else uh, you know works its way out. Um, that that has shifted a little bit toward my coaching career. We we look a lot more. I look at a lot more guys who and girls who, who just love water polo, if, and you can tell how much you know by what they're doing, how much they're uh, how much they what they send you when they when they correspond with you. Um, asking their coaches, like, does this kid, how much does this kid love water polo? And if, if you find a kid that loves water polo, they, 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 they reach their potential. Um, that means they can, they're, they're very coachable. Um, another thing too is what's huge with me is they got to be good teammates. Um, if I, if I go to watch games and I see, uh, I see guys or girls yell at each other or say, you know, hey, I was opening and passing the ball or how they treat their teammates is huge for me. Um, because we just we don't have time to deal with, um, you know, when the bullets are flying, people losing their losing their stuff. So um, we're looking for good teammates with with great potential growth and um, and just good kids. You know, obviously we want to win. Obviously we want the most talented kids. But you know, sometimes talent comes with a lot of baggage. And I've been fortunate at Long Beach not to uh, have to deal with too much of 
so too much of that. So baggage. There you go, baggage. Yeah. Um, you're also heavily involved with pipeline team drug development, and we'll and we'll take some questions here soon. We're talking with uh, Gavin Arroyo from many many places, but Long Beach State Team USA among uh, two of the more notable uh, spots as of late. Um, I think I just lost my train of thought here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into another question that I just got here that came through. Uh, what is a what is a favorite Olympic moment of yours? Is 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 there a favorite story you have from '96 or 2000 or one of the other trips or something like that from Team USA? Um, I mean, it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, opening ceremonies in Atlanta was, was pretty amazing. Um, you know, the the, the fact. That, just the, the going in the village and the, being the first time Olympian and being in your home country. And it's like all the, you know, all check off all the boxes of the dream coming true and all this stuff. And now let's focus on meddling and, and this kind of thing. Um, I just remember having a really hard time sleeping in Atlanta. Um, I was, you just feel like you're on a different planet um, during that experience. Um, so yeah, I think the opening ceremonies and, and, and doing it with a great group of guys, and both both uh, both in Sydney and in Atlanta, um, just experiencing that with the guys that you worked hard and bled with. You know, so. Yeah, you you share a story that most people that have played at that level share, and of course the wins and all of that stuff are nice, but it tends to come back to a kind of common journey together that everyone remembers the most. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's the day in and day out, you know, you're messing around and being so tired that you can't even, you know, sit on the toilet type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're watching your teammate, you know, trying to get up the stairs and you're laughing at each other. And, you know, so, you know. I, I was going to circle back to asking you about Olympic development program. And, and this really goes all the way up to the senior team. But the idea of, of people finding a role on a team. And so when I think about an Olympic team, especially being built, and maybe this happens too at the college level because you can't have a million guys on your roster, but how important is it for, for people to embrace a role? And by that, I mean, you know, if you think about even the Olympic teams you played on, I doubt it was just the top 13 guys in goals scored, you know, or the top 11 field players when it came to their offensive or defensive abilities. There were people on that team that had to embrace a specific role. And I'm curious as a coach how, how important that is for younger players to know that at a certain point to make a certain team, they may have to embrace a specific role on that team. It, you know, absolutely. And I think as you go through the levels and you get higher up, it you know, definitely becomes more job specific. Um, you know, now if we're going to 11 players and our you know, sports starts transitioning, then you know, everyone's got to be a 6'10 point guard. Then, you know, then it actually starts swinging the other way a little bit. But I always found it really, um, you know, kind of liberating to just be able to focus on, you know, extensively on one thing, on defending. And it kind of takes a lot of pressure off you from the other side of the game, you know. Um, if my role is I need to be the best post player and the best defender and, and, and then counter as hard as I can, then it's pretty, pretty, pretty simple and clear what, what, what the expectations are. Um, and you also feel like, so, you know, it's, if you're the defender, it's you and the goalie. Okay, I expect my wing defenders to be doing their job, and but you know my, my relationship with the goalies was always very strong because you know every time we dodged a bullet, I would just look back at him, or every time he'd block a backhand shot, I you know you look back and you get a nod, and, and that's you know that's that's the fun part of it. Um, you know, um, when, you know something like you know when I was in high school, I was a center and a defender and doing all you know doing all this, and then. Cal, it was, you know, survival to make the team and, and then, you know, slow, slow on the national team, it was just do this, but do this very, very well if we want the teams to succeed. So that was, that was uh, liberating for me. You talked about being a defender and whenever we have a goalie or another specific position, I always try and ask them for kind of their, their tips on how to be successful. Defender is probably the least glamorous position I often compare to the offensive line of water polo and that it probably only stands out if something goes wrong. Not, not every time, but often. So what are some just general tips that you've found over your time that make for a good defender things people can work on? You know, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, it's a little bit of low. Uh, I think you, 
I've had coaches who just kind of, they just blanketly teach defenders like this way. Um, and I also have to, I'm, what I try to do is more body type. Are you a smaller, more mobile? I was a smaller mobile or uh, defender. I couldn't coach, sure. I, I couldn't guard the same way, you know, Doug Kimball or Kyle Kopp could because of their size and strength. So I kind of had to figure out a way to survive. Um, and also depends, there's their skill sets that it depends on whether, what kind of defense you're doing. So if you're running a press, then, you know, definitely here's some skill sets, more mobility, a little, a little kind of uh, stick and move type of stuff. And then uh, once you're in the zone, then that's, and that's more smaller movements, subtler movements, more power. Uh, and, your, and your job description changes depending on what defense uh, you're running. So um, I think the most important thing is just being a step ahead. And I always kind of talk to the guys, it's like it's like the same movie every time. It's like, this is going to happen. There's the inciting incident. This is where it's still funny. Then the romantic comedy turns into drama. And then, you know, so it's like <laughs> the same plot line over and over. And, and just as defenders, you, you have the, it's every, it's 30, depending on the score, these teams are going to do the exact same things. So you have to adjust. And, and, and if you can be a step ahead, then that, then you're actually dictating in those situations and, and then you become effective. So. I think that's generally how you want to approach, um, you know, those things. So, I'm talking with Gavin Arroyo from Long Beach State and Team USA. You mentioned uh, the idea of a six ten point guard, and it just made me think about the connection between basketball and water polo. And most people I've come across in water polo, if if they like sports in general, basketball tends to be maybe their other favorite sport or the other sport that they are somewhat knowledgeable in. For you as a coach, as a player, why, why do you think those two are so closely linked so often? And, I, and I'll give you an example. Every now and again, we'll post a clip from a basketball game. It's typically a guy in the Denver Nuggets, Nikola Jokic, will throw a full-court pass. It looks like a water polo outlet pass, and people can't get enough of it. So why, why do you think those things are so closely related? Uh, well, I, it's interesting because I think as Americans, we really like basketball, and it's easy to – because it's five on five, it's pretty similar to us. There's there's press defenses on. Uh, the Europeans, well, if you ask Europeans, they'll compare their philosophy to soccer. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because we go on these trips and like Alex Obert and the coaching staff, they know everything about basketball. They know every single player. I don't know anything. <laughs> I got two kids and I don't have time to sit around. Not that I don't have time to sit around and watch sports. Like it's a bad thing. I just I don't I don't I don't have time to sure. invest. Um, but when I was playing overseas in Europe and, and just getting down, ball movement, positioning, timing, um, taking the ball deep and then and then throwing it in the middle, you know, you start, oh, well, that looks a lot like the Russian counterattack. And then you're like, oh, well, that, you know, so a lot of their mentality on, on their tactics uh, or, or soccer. And, and, and we've, if you, traditionally you've watched, I mean, the Europeans move a lot more now, but, but back in the day, they were a little more stagnant. They picked their spots and then they'd accelerate. And then, you know, you watch the American teams and they were trying to emulate basketball where it's, it's high pick and rolls and screens, movement, and this moving and moving and moving and moving. And the Europeans are just like, why are you moving? We're just moving. <laughs> we're moving. We're trying. Or, you know, so, I mean, I think definitely now the, the sport's kind of found a, a middle ground just tactically the way it's moving forward. And um, you see Europeans doing high pick and roll type stuff and, and you see us playing with stagnant in times and uh, mobile teams like Spain and, and Italy are, are not as mobile sometimes and Serbians who are not mobile are more mobile. So um, I think everything's just kind of turned to this hybrid. I, I think a lot of us do with information flow nowadays and coaches getting a little more uh, creative on, on their approach. So. We've seen a few uh, people in the comments here give out a go bears or go cow. So they're obviously excited about about your time there. So I'll, I'll ask you another question about, about that time period. We talked about you joining that team and the team being at that point, the best in college water polo. When you talk about being on a team that, that wins multiple titles consecutively, how do you describe the rhythm that that, that group is in? Obviously you're adding maybe a new person, you're losing someone year to year, but just, just consistently, what's that feel like to be on a team that is that good and that confident? You know, I, I, I've been doing a couple of podcasts lately with Brian Alexander and Steve Kerr and this kind of stuff came up and the more I think about it, the more you, you kind of look at the trend of how championships are won. They're usually 
teams are kind of going back to back or teams go a three P or, um, cause it's once you, you got to get in the finals to get the confidence to win the finals. And then once you win the finals, you, you, you definitely like separate yourself mentally from the rest of the team. Cause now everyone's a challenger. Um, and they don't, until you actually win, you're not truly believing that you can win. You're always hoping that you can win. Um, so I think you see that cyclically happen. If you look at the, the championships, you know, Cal will go a couple or, you know, these teams will go a couple. Um, it's hard to dethrone somebody that's, you know what, this is, it's almost like you become like the Rolling Stones. It's like, this is just what we do. Okay. Like <laughs> we work hard. We do this. We're good. It's November. It's time to get ready to, because anything less than a national championship is a disappointment. Um, you know, in, in losing a game where we lost my freshman year, we lost to Pepperdine. It was the only game that we lost. And I think we swam for three hours. Like, you just, we just don't lose games. That's the mentality. And um, once, once that mentality sits in it, it's pretty hard to disrupt. Um, my senior year got disrupted because I, I don't want to make excuses that two point rule didn't uh, help. Uh, we had, we had one of the best centers in the, in the country with Troy Barnhart and, uh, and we didn't have a super strong perimeter game. So um, that rule kind of messed us up a little bit. <laughs> Was that was that the first the first year of the two point was your senior year? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Bush. Yeah, that was a that that was a bit of an equalizer. And as someone who didn't really see the game played with that, I I'd be curious to see it brought back. I, I think it'd be kind of interesting, but then you're right, it would not be helpful to center center dominant teams. Yeah, I mean rule, rule manipulation it depends on your your, uh, your personnel. So every person every team has their strengths and weaknesses, and if those rules help the strengths then put you in a good spot and vice versa. So. I'm, I'm curious about this, how you got into coaching. And, and I've asked this of, of players who played at a fairly elite level. How do you, um, I guess, develop the correct expectations for players you coach compared to what you accomplish as a player? So you know what you were able to do. You know the level that you brought it. You know where you got to. But not everyone could do that, right? Because then, uh, you know, there would just not be able to be a way to – to determine the top, the very, very top players. So w was there a process for you to kind of dial back what you expected of everyone else you coached, or did you keep it at the same level and whoever made it, made it, and whoever didn't, didn't? How did you kind of handle that as you developed into a coach? I, you know, it's funny you talk about like, okay, well, as a player you did this and then you did that, or when you're doing it, I don't, I don't think you necessarily thought about, I didn't think about all that. I just thought about, I want to be the best and I'm going to train like the best and I'm going to show up every day and, and train very hard. And then things just kind of seem to kind of come along, but as it's happening, you're like, what's next? So you make the Olympic team and want a medal now. Okay. We didn't medal. Now let's, I want to try a medal again. Okay. Now I want to go play in Spain because they won the gold medal in 96. I, I just want to be around the best and I want to work with the best always. Um, and when I started coaching, coaching was great because, you know, I felt like I had all this knowledge and I could bring to, to kids and you show them a drill or you show them a technique and you can see that kind of aha look on their face and then they do it in the game and they're successful and they, you know, they give you one of these or, you know, I mean, that was so, that was so rewarding for me when I first came back from Europe when I was up at Cal coaching with Kurt, um, you know, and I kind of fell in love with that group and we had, you know, John Manns and Mike Sharps yeah. and the guys that, uh, you know, they, uh, Jeff Terrells, they just, ate it up and they were animals. So that wasn't, that wasn't difficult for me, that, that work ethic with that group and the willing to learn with that group, I think probably just sold me on coaching at that moment, you know, um, you know, then, and then going to Long Beach too, it's like kids that are hungry to learn. It's that, that's the rewarding part. And, you know, you look at, okay, national championships or do we win or do we win conference? You know, it's, it's, it's seeing the look on these kids faces that they want to learn. And if they want to learn, then, then you look up and say, oh, great. Oh, we won or we didn't win or okay. But, but as long as that aspect is there for me, then, then I'm enjoying it for sure. Just a couple more questions here for, for uh, Gavin O'Reilly going to the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame later this year. Also a coach with Team USA in Long Beach State. You mentioned your time in Europe. When you went over to play in Europe, it, it wasn't as common a thing as it is now for national team athletes uh, I think you went over probably mid mid to late 90s. What, what was that experience like for you to go over there and to be 
kind of one of the Americans playing abroad and, and how do you think that helped raise the profile of water polo in the U S you know, I don't, I don't know about that per se, but I know it all comes down to the people you look up to, you know, when I was going through, uh, you know, Chris Humbert and, uh, uh, Alex Rousseau and, and Rick McNair and some of these guys were, were playing overseas, Craig Wilson, still legendary in Barcelona for how good he yeah. was. Um, they still talk about him. Um, you know, it was a combination between that and then when we traveled with the national team, um, just kind of seeing the lifestyle of a pro player um, in Europe, it was, it was it was pretty glorifying to see these guys. They were like celebrities, you know. Um, and not that I was chasing to be a celebrity, but I wanted to, you know, be somewhere where water polo mattered. And, and sure. And you go to Greece and on the front page is water polo on the front page of like the sports page, you know. You know, we were just in Italy and it's, it's in the, you know, it's on the front page of their sports things. Like people really care about it there. So that, that made it pretty fun. Right. Um, <laughs> and not to mention it was, they were the best and, and going through a nine month season, um, we we're expected to perform every weekend. Uh, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a big difference between, um, you know, what we're doing right now, or what, we're, what we're trying to get more, more high level games for our kids and, you know, and our, our college season is only three months and then, rest of the time well you know what we're just training so um you know i think there were guys that went before me um i think our group did a pretty good job of getting over there uh, yeah i know the bailey jeff power generation those guys did a great job getting over there so we're just trying to get back to that and this last year we had the most guys that we've ever had um with this group playing in europe and i know the guys that are in college are hungry to get over there too so i think you know, the last five years has been a real resurgence in um, that. That just has to be part of our game right now uh, until we have until we have a national league that we can play every weekend and sponsors and money and all that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, two two part question here for someone who has traveled the world playing water polo. Your your favorite place that you ever played a water polo game, and then I'll say the prettiest or most beautiful setting for a water polo game. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, there's, there's a, I guess there's a couple. The Olympiakos uh, Vulogmeni rivalry is pretty big in Greece. Uh, I've never been in a situation where uh, you know you get rocks and flares thrown at you, and <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty intense. I mean, the place is burning down. Uh, we actually, when I was playing at Vulogmeni, not for Olympiakos, they they, the club was pretty much broken after our games. They had to put cages up. And, I mean, it's just as a player, there's nothing, there's nothing that can compare. Um, I think the best game, two of them were the, uh, our final game in Atlanta against Yugos then Yugoslavia. We played in front of 15,000 for that one. And then in 97, we played in Greece at the FINA Cup Finals, and there was about 15,000 of that one too. So those... Those are the most intense, um, the prettiest place. Um, yeah, probably, probably those beach courses in Dubrovnik. Those are yeah. pretty nice. Uh, in Greece, they have a lot of beach courses. Um, I guess anytime you can be in the sea playing it's in the Med or the Adriatic, it's pretty incredible. So. Yeah, I I figured it might it might end up circling back to Croatia or to Greece on that. Um, and then, and then just the last thing for you, you know, it's obviously postponed a year, but Tokyo coming, what, what will it mean, you know, for you to kind of return to the Olympic stage, you know, as a, as a coach, after having been there as a player, when you think to now Tokyo 2021? You know, I think kind of to circle back to what I was doing before or saying before is, um, you know, as a coach, it's, it's their time now. Um, it's Team USA's time. I, I feel like if this is their dream and this is if I can do anything to help that dream come true, if any way I can prepare them for what may happen or if I can prepare them for how they might feel before the first game or how they're going to feel the night before a crossover game. I mean, the level of pressure is through the roof. If, if you haven't gone through it, it's, uh, there's nothing else like it. I mean, job interviews, no problem. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever pressure you're thinking about, you know, professionally right now, and there's nothing compared to the night before a crossover game. Um, 
So, you know, if you haven't gone through that, or even if you have gone through that, it is, it, sometimes it's even worse after you've gone through it because you know it's coming. If you haven't gone through it, you're kind of like, oh, this is, this is a big deal. And then, you know, the second time through, you're like, this is a really big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, if I can help them navigate that through focusing on their skill sets and, and, and polishing, the, um, you know, uh, our, our product, or getting them ready, then we can have something to fall back on. And um, so that's, that's my hope that I can get them physically and skill fundamental ready for what they're going to face. So. Yeah, it's great stuff. And as, as many of uh, the Olympic hopefuls have said, you know, the date changes, but the dream remains the same. So uh, Tokyo 2021 is on the way. Gavin, oh, always good to chat with you. Uh, congrats on, on all the good stuff uh, going your way. And in the past that we dug up, thanks for humoring me on all your old water polo stories. And we're looking forward to seeing you at a uh, pool here soon when everything gets back to normal. Sounds good, Greg. Thank you so much.